session um, as a courtesy, I would ask uh, each of our partic participants to mute your microphones um, until the presenters or instructor ask you to uh, a question or to invite you to give your um, opinion on a particular um, matter. Uh, Christian, if you can uh, begin the recording. I would appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Brown, are you ready? I am, sir. Thank you very much. So, um, in today's uh, session, uh, the presenters will be Mr. Brown and Mr. Wilmore uh, from the Bahamas. Um, and they will be going over a number of topics. So I think, uh, remind me what today's topics are? Block charge. Block. Block of charge. So um, this will be an interesting um, discussion, and I, I know everyone would have their uh, viewpoints. Um, like the previous sessions, um, if there are any videos, uh, we will put the video or the YouTube link in the chat so you can review it and you can make your own assessment, either volunteer uh, what the call is, or if you are asked to give a response, please unmute your mic and uh, give your response. I would now turn it over to you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Haynes. And thank you, audience, um, for joining our program once again. Are we all right? Yes, we're good. OK. Um, thank you once again for joining the program. And I um, want to once again remind you of the host rules. Um, we, want to, we wish to thank um, um, or recognize the great, the great sudden basketball. Something is going wrong here. Something. We good? Can we continue? Yeah. Yes, you can continue. Okay. First of all, allow me to recognize the Great Sudden Basketball Association from Ontario, Canada, for providing some of the information that is going to be taught here this evening. And to also recognize Ms. Barbet Ogaro for providing the media, along with Mr. Ian Yearwood. Um, both of them are from the Cayman Islands for providing the, the, the media from which we are broadcasting this evening. Um, having said that, um, I think it's going to be a very interesting evening, um, reference to the block and the charge. And so I'm now, uh, I'm going to just go into, turn it back over to you, Mr. Patrick. Thank you, Freddie, for that. Oh, yeah. uh, I know we've had um, some uh, in-depth discussions uh, over the past couple of weeks. Um, I know at the end of this module, there will be an online exam. So I do hope everyone is taking note on some of the material, um, not just a discussion, but also taking your own notes um, for your own education purposes and for you to also take back to your communities um, you know, they always say uh, a, a quote from Nelson Mandela, says, Nelson Mandela was that uh, sport has the power to unite our communities. So let us use the sport of basketball to unite our communities. I know there's a lot of uh, um, inequality and injustice that is happening. And FIBA has released their, uh, their position on this, uh, what is happening. And I hope everyone has had an opportunity to walk, first read it understand it and be able to speak about it openly within their communities. Um, at this time, um, we would like to just go right into the program. Um, I know there are going to be some late straddlers, uh, but uh, uh, Wilmore, if you can uh, just you know moderate the chat and see who's, um, who's asking questions in the chat um, and um, either ask for a break to give an indication to that person, either present their question or um, their interpretation. Um, I'm not sure who's going to be leading first, but either Christian or uh, Freddie, it's uh, on to you. Thank you. Thanks again, Patrick. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Christian, who would um, give an official introduction of himself. A very pleasant good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Wilmore. I am going to be assisting uh, Mr. Brown 
with this presentation this evening. Um, I'm sure he needs no introduction, but maybe you don't know who I am. I'm from the Bahamas. Um, Mr. Brown is my countryman. I'm a referee. I've been refereeing for 12, going on 13 years. I've been a FIBA referee for the last eight um, of those years. Um, and I've been um, refereeing at various levels of competition around the world, uh, inclusive of uh, three world championships, now called World Cup experiences, uh, numerous regional tournaments, uh, America Cup and World Cup qualifier games, and presently, um, in addition to what I do internationally, um, I happen to be a president of a local referee association here in New Providence. So it's a pleasure for me to be here with you and I look forward to uh, dialoguing um, and sharing my experience um, as a referee um, both tonight and tomorrow and in future courses um, as I am asked to lead. Is that good, Mr. Brown? Yes, please. You can put it up for your screen. Okay. Just give me a sec. You can go ahead, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Christian, um, for the wonderful introduction. Well, of course, um, our training agenda um, for this evening is as follows. We're going to have a brief introduction. Um, and then guidelines for calling the block or the charge. That will be followed by when do block or charge situation occur in the game. The reactions in today's game with respect to the block or charge. And then we would go into the general rules per Article 33 that deals with contact, the general principles. You'll have a video presentation that demonstrates Article 33. And that will be followed um, by questions and answers or comments at the end of the Having said that, I will move right along. The block or charge game awareness. That's my introduction. The block and charge, it is considered one of the most difficult call for referees to manage. In managing it correctly, the referee is considered analyzing phases of a potential block, and he should consider these areas. The proper distance and stationary from the plate, keeping an open angle, generally 45 degrees, and remaining stationary when they're gonna blow the whistle. Also to consider refereeing the defense, Often the offense is refereed, but the defense is not. But in order to get a good call, you referee the defender. Look for illegal action to call. And in order to do so, one must have an, an active mindset on the court, particularly when you're refereeing a one-on-one -on -one situation. And then have a key players, have the key players or one-on-one -on -one and others in your field of vision. Next slide. The guidelines for calling the block or the charge. Today's referee understands that most block and charge decision will be met with exacting disagreement, particularly from the side penalized. However, 
Referees are always advised to express confidence in their call by taking into account considering the following guidelines. Next slide. In considering it, you must anticipate the play and not the call. Anticipate the play, but not the call. Determine what the offensive player is trying to accomplish while observing what the defense is doing. See the whole play from start to finish with a wide angle possible. The closer to the action the referee is, the more difficult it is to judge that action. Establish quickly if the defender has established a legal guarding position. And have I mentioned LGP, that means legal guarding position. Note the point of contact. If contact is on the torso, it is a good indicator who got the position first. Be sure the contact results in player place at a disadvantage or move from their legal garden position and not be influenced by dramatics. And most of the dramatics that we talk about is generally the block or overreacting to the block or the charge. Next slide. When do block or charge situation occurs? It occurs generally on a one-on-one -on -one play. When the game or the ball is in transition. When defensive help situation with the defense switching. Pressing situations. And then of course, the pass and crash. <laughs> when the offense pass or shoot the ball while airborne and then the crash. Next slide. I will now turn this section over to Mr. Christian Wilmore. Okay. So I am sure most of us who are here this evening are uh, fans of the basketball game, meaning that we spend some uh, period of time either as referees, as regular fans, as table officials, coaches, or players. And I'm sure you would agree that there is arguably no call that garners the type of emotional response that a block charge call garners in, in the basketball game. For whatever reason, and I will kind of go into that in a second, the block charge situation is perhaps the most <coughs> situation in the basketball game, um, generally speaking, when we talk about um, eliciting a response, an emotional response, not only from the players, but also from coaches as well as from fans. Um, to be honest, the block charge situation is probably the, the uh, number one situation in the game in terms of uh, eliciting an emotional response from a referee. Um, I'm sure most of you would say that if, if a referee is going to sell a call or become animated on any call in the game, chances are it's going to be a block or a charge situation. And so for that reason, it is important that, okay, yes, that we get all uh, calls and decisions right, but very much so, a lot of attention is placed on block charge situations um, from all parties involved in the game, from the stands, to the playing court, to the sidelines. So why is that the case, right? So why do people seem to 
whether you call it right or wrong, or if you call it nothing, no matter what decision you make in a block charge situation, there's always going to be a strong response, usually particularly from the team that was penalized, but even from the team who favored, uh, um, who benefited from the call, there's a lot more clapping and yelling. They seem to be so excited if a block charge situation goes in their favor. Why is that the case? Well, there's a few things um, I would just point out. Number one, the block charge play is perhaps um, the most physical uh, uh, um, type of contact that you're going to get in the basketball game, especially if it happens during transition where players are moving at high speed um, or as Mr. Brown alluded to, pass and crash. Um, situations, there's usually going to be a player on the floor, maybe both players, maybe more than the two players involved. So it's a very, it's a very physical uh, um, type of contact. So that's number one. It's, so it's going to create a lot of emotions due to that nature. Number two, and perhaps from the players and coaches will agree with me here, especially in terms of the defender, they have to work so hard to especially to draw a charge. When you're guarding a player who has the advantage of moving forward full speed, I mean, you're looking here at pictures of LeBron James and Steph Curry, arguably two of the best, uh, number one, two arguably in the game um, right now. You can imagine that it's no easy feat to try and keep your body in front of these two players um, and in the case of someone like a LeBron James, someone with his size um, and someone with his power, it, it can be a, a, a quite daunting um, ask for any defender to try and draw a charge or stay in front of, of him um, on a penetration play. So you can imagine then that if a player is able to draw a charge on, uh, uh, on, on him or players like him, they're going to be very excited because it's difficult to stay in front of them. It's going to be a lot of contact. It can arguably, um, there's a high risk of potential injury, um, whether it be an elbow, whether it be feet get tangled and, and players trip over one another. There are all kinds of, of, of other factors beyond just is it a block or a charge that go into these type of situations. So as a referee, you have to be mindful and prepared that this type of contact one needs to be officiated. Uh, 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 FIBA generally has this philosophy. Um, when you have players hitting the floor, in, 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 in particular, on a block charge situation, uh, a call must be made. Whether it's block, whether it's charge, or in some cases, if it's flopping, um, a decision has to be made because the the consequences of not making a decision or not being prepared to make a decision due to the emotions that come with this play situation can be quite dire. Um, I, I would say also that in the extreme, if these situations are not officiated uh, um, strongly and consistently by officials, these type of situations can easily lead to brawls, can lead to fights because you have players who are generally might be on the floor or it gives rise to more excessive contact in other areas of the game. So for all of the reasons I, I see there, you really want to make sure that this type of play is officiated consistently and fairly from start to finish, because it's going to help you manage the emotions of the game in totality. But we'll talk uh, more about it as we move through the slide. Mr. Brown? Next slide. Um, very good. Thank you, Christian. Um, in order to really judge the block or the charge appropriately and to blow that system, all right, one must understand, as the rule book would have it, the cylinder principle. And that is the space within an imaginary cylinder occupied by a player on the floor 
It includes the space above the player and it's limited to the front by the palm of the hands, the rear by the buttocks, the sides by the outer edge of the arms and leg. Hands and arms may be extended in front of the torso, no further than the position of the feet, with arms bent at the elbow, so that the forearm and hands are raised. That's your normal guarding position. The distance between the feet will vary according to the height of the player. Next I'm sorry, Go right ahead, Christian. Uh, all right, sorry about that. That was multitasking. Okay, so Mr. Brown uh, just gave us the, uh, the word uh, description of what is the cylinder principle. And so this graphic, um, which is, uh, you might recognize it, comes directly from the official basketball uh, rules, speaks to give you a visual uh, depiction of what the cylinder principle is or what is the cylinder and what is a, a player in particular, a defensive player, what space are they entitled to? So I will bounce back between two slides, the one that Mr. Brown just read and this uh, um, slide to help us um, wrap our minds around this because this is very important for us to adjudicate block charge situations consistently. So the first bullet point um, that was read about the cylinder principle is that the cylinder principle is the space within an imaginary cylinder occupied by a player on the floor. But the key point I want to start with is includes the space above the player. So I can't say how many times I have heard um, coaches, players, and to be truthful, even officials from time to time, um, a defender has a good legal guarding position. And for whatever reason, that defender, because maybe the offensive player is jumping to the basket, that defender may jump as well. And so you might hear the expression, you shouldn't have jumped, or you should stay on the floor. Why did you jump? When you jump, that's a block. That's an automatic block. But actually, that's not true. And that's not in keeping with the rule of the cylinder principle as it's defined. The cylinder extends all the way up to the roof. So it goes as far as you can go up vertically from that player's position before you hit the first obstruction. So if you were to take this cone, and it obviously here you notice that they have the cylinder extending way above the player's head and hands. It, it is not only the space that the player is standing in, but it is also the space above the player all the way up to the roof. So in this situation, in situations like this, we have to first understand that a player is entitled to jump in within the cylinder as high as they can. So the first kind of confusion um, we, we, we sometimes reach in when we talk about block charge is this idea that you're not entitled to jump. Once you occupy the cylinder and you stay within this cylinder, it also extends all the way, excuse me, all the way into the air as high as you can go before you reach your obstruction. That's point number one. Point number two is that you will notice it says that the cylinder is limited to, and by limited, we're talking about where it stops. The cylinder stops in the front by the palm of the hands and in the rear by the buttocks. So I'll just take those two points. Front by the palm of the hands in the rear by the buttocks. If you look very carefully here, you see that the hands of the player are not extended in front of his body further than his toes. 
or in this case, because he's in a slightly knelt position than his knees. And so in essence, when they say the front by the palm of the hands, um, what, what we want to know is that you are not entitled to stretch your hands out as if you are, for instance, pushing a door or something of that sort. It doesn't mean by the palm of the hands as far as you can push your hands. It means by the palm of the front of the palm of your hands if you were to stand in this position. So the other way I would say is that your cylinder essentially, if you were to draw a line. <laughs> Sorry about that. If you were to draw a line from the tip of your nose straight down to your uh, your toes, that kind of marks where your cylinder ends from toe. Sorry, from nose to big toe. That imaginary line in the front is your cylinder. If you were to get into what we would call a, a, a normal guarding position, a defense which is usually knees slightly bent, which would extend your hips just a little bit behind you, where your buttocks ends is where your cylinder ends. And you'll see why this is important. Um, you're not allowed to stick out your butt or contort your body outside of this general cylinder. This is un under normal circumstances. Anything uh, um, varying from this stance would not be considered as a cylinder, a normal cylinder for a player to occupy. Why do I say this? Because as you know, in games, players tend to extend parts of their body outside of their cylinder. So they might very well, for instance, have this position first. But if a player starts to get by them and cut behind them, they might stick their butt out. Or if a player starts to blow by them on the side, they might lean their shoulder or mm -hmm. stick out their knee. And that's what, and that's what the cylinder principle is meant to uh, um, define. What position are you allowed to occupy? So when we talk vertically, all the way up to the roof. When we talk to the front yeah. of their body, um, pretty much in line with their with their nose and their the tip of um, and their big toe. If we talk about behind them, where their buttocks ends is where their cylinder ends. Now, when we go to to the side, because this is perhaps the most difficult one, because players tend to lean from one way to the next, especially when they're trying to stay in front of a fast player. It says the cylinder is limited to the sides by the outer edge of the of the arms and legs. So if we go back now to what that means, if you take a normal stance, a normal athletic stance, which is feet about shoulder width apart and arms bent at the elbow, almost as if to say hands up, don't you, in that sort of a, a stance, wherever the outer edge of that is on your arms and on your feet, that would be your cylinder. So any part of your body that you contort after the fact that would extend beyond that those lines on the side to be considered outside of the cylinder. So this is very important for us to know, especially when we begin to look at video plays. If you were to stand, feet shoulder width apart with a slight bend in the knees and hands in the hands up, don't shoot position. That's your cylinder. From your tip of your nose down to your toes, rear of your buttocks and the, and the side of your legs and your arms is your cylinder. Anything um, that you extend outside of that, you are no longer occupying your cylinder, which another way you can interpret that is if you're not occupying your cylinder, you very well could be occupying someone else's cylinder and you're not necessarily permitted to do that. Okay. Um, and, and just to be uh, clear, notice that it says the distance between the feet will vary according to the height of the player. So there's no one size fit all policy here. It, it goes to reason that a player who is seven foot, um, someone like a uh, Anthony Davis or uh, a Nikola Jokic or someone of that kind of size, their cylinder 
is going to be much larger than a Stephen Curry or someone of his size or a Nate Robinson or someone like that. Because obviously, for a seven-footer to take a comfortable stance, when we talk about feet shoulder width apart, that's going to occupy a much broader space than someone who is 6'2 or 6'3 occupying the same space. In addition to that, if you ask a seven-footer to um, extend, put his hands up and bend them at the elbow, Anthony Davis and Kevin Durant, for example, they have very long arms so and very long legs. That The, the width of their cylinder is going to be much um, broader than a stockier, more compact player. So it's important to note that you, you, you have to also take into consideration the size and the dimensions of the player when examining if they are in their cylinder or not. Okay, Mr. Brown. Okay, um, thank you very much. We dealt with the cylinder principle front, rear, sides, arm extended within that and occupying that space. And once you're in that cylinder, you that's your space and you own it. Um, we now go to the principle of verticality. Each player has the right to occupy any space or position within their cylinder, of course, on the playing court, not occupied by an opponent. This includes the space above him when he jumps vertically within that space. And I think Christian did a wonderful job of explaining that and trying to get across the referees that, hey, notwithstanding a person jumping right up in their cylinder, that does not mean that that person actually created the contact because they are still in their legal garden position, so to speak, within their cylinder. The player who leaves his vertical position or leaves his cylinder and contacts occur with an opponent who had already established his own vertical position or cylinder that player leaving his position is responsible for the contact. Kindly note, the defensive player must not be penalized for leaving the floor vertically within his cylinder or when his hands and arms extend above him with his, within his cylinder. Too often we've seen where referees tend to penalize the defense in this regard. And, um, but you don't see a whole lot of that at the um, at, at high level competition where the guys are big, they experienced, they know their stuff. So we, that's something we need to work on as a basketball community. The offensive player, whether on the floor or airborne, shall not cause contact with the defensive player in a legal guarding position by using his arms to create space for himself or simply pushing off or spreading leg or, or arms to cause the contact during, an, during or immediately after a shot for a field goal. Christian, you wish to elaborate on that? Yes, I, I can uh, uh, chime in here. Um, I, I love the language of, of this rule. Um, it's, a very, it's a very decisive language uh, that FIBA used here. They noticed that they said, they didn't say the offensive player should not cause contact, or it says shall not cause contact, meaning, and the reason why I point that out is because we have this strong, in, in basketball uh, around the world, there's this strong, idea of you know if for whatever reason the, there is contact between a defensive player and an offensive player and it doesn't look right we are going to penalize the defense we, we're going to some if someone must be penalized it, it must be the defense because there's contact 
And a lot of times, especially on drive to the baskets, I don't want to get ahead of myself because I know we're going to look at some plays, but it is important when we are judging these block charge situations, and, and this goes back to an important IOT that I think you have heard about and that we'll discuss. When you're talking about referee the defense, if this defensive player is inside his cylinder and has done nothing wrong and there is contact, whether or not the offensive player gets ends up on the floor outside of the court or whatever have you, and sometimes it looks bad, that's irrelevant. We have to look at this defensive player and determine, did the defensive player do something wrong? And many times, and the players are very good, to this first point when it says the offensive player should not push off, a lot of times, and I, I, I do sometimes when, I, when I'm talking to newer referees, I have to, uh, I often point this out. The, 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 the small guards and the very quick players, they are really good at when they drive to the basket in order to get the angle um, that they want to finish at the rim, or sometimes in order to avoid the, 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 the shot blocker at the rim, they will intentionally drive into the body of the defensive player and then use the off hand to push their self off and get a new angle away from the, the defensive player. And in full game speed, it can look as if the defensive player has created some illegal contact. But in many cases, it is the offensive player. And not a lot of times do we see this called where a defensive player is in their legal guarding position. The offensive player with their off hand sometimes pushes their hand away so that they can't block the shot. Or if they are more equally matched in size, pushes the defensive player away so that they can get a, 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 clear lead, a clear shot at the basket. And we don't penalize the offensive player for this action. As a matter of fact, in many cases, we penalize the defensive player and call an and one. We have to be very careful with this type of situation. And the second point here, spread leg or arms. Um, and this is talking about spreading the feet during a shot. This is a point of emphasis in FIBA now because Many players are doing this, in particular on the three-point shot. Uh, uh, the defenders, you know, the biggest one of the biggest rules or no-nos in coaching for basketball players is don't foul the shooter. We've all heard it. You don't want to put the three-point shooter on the line. And so defensive players, in most cases, especially at the adult level where they are more mentally and psychologically focused during the game, they do their best to not create contact with these offensive players during the shot but these offensive players have gotten very very smart where as the defensive player runs by them i call it the fly by hand up and just run right by the the, the offensive player they will just extend their leg enough to create a contact and if we are not watching the entire situation it very well can uh, um, trick us into calling a foul on the defensive player when in essence it is the offensive player who created the contact. I, I will say one more thing about this. If I had to summarize everything I just said, I will say it like this. The defensive, the, sorry, the cylinder principle does not apply only for the defense. It also applies for the offense. When I say that, if an offensive player uh, puts a part of their body outside of their normal cylinder. And that extension outside of their cylinder creates a contact that has an effect on the play. Then it is the offensive player who is, is, is creating an illegal act and not the defensive player. So we referee the defense, yes, but we, in some cases, in particular, this extending the foot on the shot, who is it that is outside of their normal cylinder? And in those cases, is the offensive player putting a part of their body outside of their cylinder to create a contact with a defensive player who is 
not in their cylinder. And so we have to judge this uh, um, consistently. But this will be explained a little bit better with videos, I'm sure. Mr. Brown, you want to go? Next, next slide. And that brings us now to what is a legal guarding position? What is a legal guarding position? A defensive player has established an initial legal guarding position when he is facing his opponent and he has both feet on the floor. The legal garden position extends vertically above him, that's within a cylinder, from the floor to the ceiling. We explained that already. He may raise his arms and hands above his head or jump vertically must, sorry, you'll see most, but that should be must maintain arms and hands in a vertical position inside the imaginary cylinder. For the defensive player, in order for him to establish an initial legal garden position, he must face his opponent, have both feet on the floor, and then the legal garden position extends vertically above him. And he may raise his arms and hands above his head or jump vertically, but must maintain arms and hands in a vertical position inside the imaginary cylinder. Kindly be reminded of the word initial. Initial guarding position, which means that there there is another position to follow or other position to follow in order to maintain the legal guarding position. Christian Wayne. I just want to say one thing about this, um, and this is going to be important when we analyze um, and look at some videos a, a little bit later. Note very carefully that when they talk about establishing the initial legal guarding position, uh, um, nothing is said about how close, there's nothing mentioned here about distance between the defensive player and the offensive player in establishing <coughs> the initial legal guarding position. All it says is that the defensive player has to face his opponent and have both feet on the floor. So hypothetically, you can establish, especially if you're looking about in an, a transition play, let's say you are on defense and your team sets up a half court, uh, a, a trap or half court press, and you pick up, you're the defensive player, and you pick up your coverage from the half court line. If you're standing at that half court line, your player is on the next baseline getting ready to progress with the ball. Hey, Christian, we you lost you. Hello? Yeah, we kind of lost you just now, Christian. Okay, I'll start again. Just um, slow down a bit, yeah. Okay. I would say, I was saying that there's no mention here about distance between the defensive player and the offensive player in terms of establishing the initial legal guarding position. All it says is that the defensive player must face their opponent and have both feet on the floor. And this is very important because you will see when we look at clips, you can establish this initial legal guarding position. In some instances, it might be rather close, but in other instances, for example, in transition or fast break play situations, you might start establish your initial legal guarding position at a half court's length. I was giving the uh, scenario, if your team is utilizing a half court press, let's say a half court man to man press, for example, and you're on defense, the distance between you and your, your uh, opponent, your coverage in the, in, in the beginning of that press could very well be 20, 30 feet away. But the minute you face your opponent and you have both feet on the floor, you have established the initial legal guarding position. 
Now, as Mr. Brown suggested, and he see we'll get into, there are other positions and other uh, uh, movements to follow. But it is very important when we look at these plays, I'm going to ask you repeatedly, was an initial legal guarding position um, established? And that can be rather close, or it could have happened seconds before the actual contact situation occurred. So that's all I wanted to chime in and say. Next slide. Great. Um, actually, Christian just covered this part of it, um, at least the first bullet. So we're dealing now with guarding a player who controls the ball. When guarding a player who controls the ball, and Christian just explained it, the elements of time and distance do not apply. It does not apply. Player with the ball must expect, expect, is expected to be guarded and be prepared to stop and change his direction when an opponent take a legal guarding position in front of him, even if this is done within a fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. The subject here is guarding a player the with the ball. ball. The other bullet, the defensive player must establish an initial guarding position without causing contact before taking that position. And following this, he may now move to guard his opponent, but may not extend his, his arms, shoulder, hips, or legs to prevent the dribbler, to prevent the dribbler from passing by him. Way in, Christian. I I really um, the only thing I would mention, I think you did a good job, <laughs> is is it's just two quick things here. Note that it says, even if this is done within a fraction of a second, and what that means is if you are the player with the ball, if your defender jumps in front of you, and, and this is in, in terms of, and gets to that position, they don't have to give you a step. They don't have to give you a second. They don't have to give you two seconds. They can establish that legal guarding position in front of you like that. You are not entitled. That's, when, that's what they mean when they say the elements of time and distance do not apply. A, one, a player who has the ball, the ball handler, he must expect to be guarded all the time, and he must be expect to be guarded immediately. So that's very important, and we'll talk about that in the videos. But I want to say to the last point, we have this thing, and please eliminate this from your vocabulary. When we have a block charge situation, the fans, coaches, and players to this day, when a referee calls a charge, and in this situation, let's assume the referee is correct, and he calls a charge, I always hear players and coaches and fans say, the defensive player was moving. He was moving. And FIBA basketball rules has clearly stated, at least from my side of referee, and I'm sure before that, so at least 12, 13 years, notice what it says. He may now move to guard his opponent. The fact that the defensive player is moving, quote unquote, moving when contact occurs does not make the contact automatically a block. Basket, the way I always tell referees when I'm doing courses, basketball is not a stationary game. You cannot play defense stationary. If you were to force defensive players to be stationary in order to play defense, what would be the point? When you're guarding players like um, the good players, LeBron James and Stephen Curry, you would never be able to is that is that the player, player must establish, establish his initial legal guard position. And from that point, he is allowed to move. So one of the uh, one of the big, big misconceptions is that. Hey, Christian. Christian, Christian, Christian let me stop you. Um, you kind of broke up just now. So if you can go back from when you started, quote unquote, um, if you can give that explanation, because we lost you for a, a moment just now. Okay. Let me just double check something here. Okay.
sorry everyone i think my internet kind of dipped there i'll, I'll just say the 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 point um the take home point i was trying to make is that this this um explanation that because a defensive player is moving therefore the contact is automatically a block is inherently false that is not the 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 only criteria that we use to determine if it is a block or charge and you're going to see in the videos that we have for you you're going to see situations where the defensive player is as we say quote unquote moving when contact occurs but it is a charge so that's the one bullet point on that uh, slide and i know you can't see it right now i'm going to put it up for you again in a second that's the one bullet point on that slide that i really think people need to circle and underline he may move. You are permitted to move when defending your player and your moving doesn't automatically make any contact after that point a block. That is the take home for that. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, let's go to the next slide. Just give me one second here. I'm putting the PowerPoint back up again. You should see it shortly. And we just covered guarding a player who controls the ball. Guarding a player who controls the ball. Is it up? Yes, it's up. It should be. You should see it now. And now we go to judging the block or charge situation involving a player with or without the ball. The referee should consider the principle. The following principles. Defensive player must establish, and here it is again, an initial guarding position by facing the player with the ball and having both feet on the floor. That's the initial guarding position. Defensive player may remain stationary. The defensive player may jump vertically. Defensive player may move laterally or backward in order to maintain the initial legal guarding position. And I need to go over that again. The defensive player following um, establishing is in, in an initial guarding position, legal guarding position. He may move laterally or side to side or backward in order to maintain the initial or his initial legal guarding position. When moving to maintain the initial guarding position, one foot or both feet may be off the floor for an instant, as long as the movement is lateral or backward. So after you establish, once a person have established an initial legal guarding position, then they may move from side to side and in that process, um, it is obvious that the legs or the feet may will move above the floor, but not towards the player with the ball. Um, if contact must occur on and contact must occur on the torso, hence the defensive player would be responsible for the contact. Having established a legal garden position. The defensive player may turn within a cylinder to avoid an injury. And I'm going to go through that. Let me just read that off again. Having established a legal guarding position, the defensive player may move, may turn within his cylinder to avoid injury. Way in, Christian. Um, I will leave the turning within the cylinder part for you. I, I will just go back to the, to the part about where I was talking about moving. And the reason why is because now what I would like fans and players and coaches and even some referees to do now is to change our language and not say that, Mr. Ref, it's a block because the defensive player was moving. Because the rule says the defensive player may move, but it says he is only allowed to move laterally, which is side to side, or he's allowed to move 
backwards. So if you're going to tell me as a referee that it should, um, you know, Christian, it should be a block because the defensive player was moving, the only way you could use that as a, as a reason is if you say the defensive player was moving toward the offensive player because that is the only type of movement that is not permitted when trying to maintain the legal guarding position. This is very important. It says he, once he has established the initial legal guarding position, from there, he can stay stationary, but he doesn't have to. He can jump, but he doesn't have to. And he can move, but he is only permitted to move side to side or backwards. The only movement that is not permitted is movement towards the player with the ball. So this is, 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 is a very important point for us to know. Can the defensive player move and get a charge? Yes, if they have already established the initial legal guarding position, and if their movement is side to side or backwards, they, it is possible for them to get a charge. The only movement that automatically disqualifies a player from being able to get a charge call is if the movement is towards the player with the ball. Okay? okay. All right, Mr. Brown. All right, Mr. Brown. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have a next slide, right? We go right into the videos. No, no there are no more slides. Okay, then we can go right into the videos. And on completion of the videos, we would wrap up yes. and with, with questions and answers. Go right into your videos. Okay. When judging contact situations between two opponents, the officials must apply the principles of establishing a legal guarding position by the defensive player. Stationary position of the defensive player, legal lateral or backwards movement, principles of cylinder and verticality, regulations governing player in the air. Point of emphasis. Charging is illegal personal contact by moving into an opponent's body. The following are examples when blocking fouls are called incorrectly. The following examples should be called as charges. Let's have a closer look. Red 4 receives a ball and dribbles to the opponent's basket. Okay, we are having some issues. I'm going to put the uh, link for the video in the chat as well for those of you um, for whom it may be freezing. Hey, Christian, it's Patrick. Um, yeah, we had this issue uh, throughout the week. So what we've done was take the link, put it in the chat, and everyone can watch it locally, and then we can start to discuss it. Okay, I just posted the link in the chat for everyone. Um, so you should be able to access it uh, through YouTube as well. And then we will uh, commence and uh, re return here and we can discuss. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yes, Freddie, you're back. Okay. So we just, we, I, I shared the uh, video link with them, the direct link to YouTube, oh. um, so okay. that they can, uh, no, you don't have to um, 
we're not going to watch the entire thing uh, um, today. I would say okay. um, no more than the first um, about seven to eight minutes would be sufficient um, for us to uh, 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 get the point across and then we can return here and discuss. Okay, great. I would say that um, it's not necessary to watch beyond um, the maximum would be beyond the nine minute and 50 second uh, uh, mark. Um, the, the other half of the video uh, we'll be discussing uh, tomorrow. I will share the link again for those of you who are just joining us. We are uh, watching uh, this YouTube video on block and charge. Um, we're not going, it's an 18 minute video, but we're not watching the entire 18 minutes of it. We're just going to watch about the first nine and a half minutes. And if there's any clip that intrigues you or you have questions about, just please take a note um, of the, I guess the minute or second of the video so that uh, where that clip is so that we can take a look um, at it together and then we can discuss what is happening. So um, grab a pen if necessary and just make a mental, um, sorry, write down the time of the clip if, if there's something that you want to ask about it. And then we'll, uh, in the next, let's say, nine minutes, so at 8.13, uh, we will um, reconvene and answer any questions that you may have.
Okay, Mr. Brown, are you there? Um, yes, sir. I think most Any people feedback from the audience. I think most people would have um, been able to watch the first uh, nine minutes by now. And so this is the part of the uh, webinar where we open up the floor to you to you can uh, raise your hand and speak or if you wish to type your question into the chat um, and I will um, read them. Anything you want to say, comments, questions, anything you would like uh, me or Mr. Brown to take a look at, uh, please, this is your time. While you're gathering your thoughts, because I can see some people are, are typing and thinking, those who have their cameras on, I will say uh, one of the things you probably noticed right away with those videos is how many situations, uh, like Mr. Brown and I mentioned, where the defensive player was quote unquote moving, and they said that it should be a charge. Because the key is they establish at some point that initial legal guarding position where they are two feet on the floor and face their opponent. Once they have done that first step, they are then permitted to move to maintain that legal guarding position in front of their defensive player. And if there's contact while they're maintaining that, then um, it can be a charge. Uh, yes, uh, Julian, you have something you wish to contribute? I'm, maybe the videos were very clear, Mr. Brown, I don't know. I, I, I it must have been. <laughs> That's fine. I'm just, just I'm, I'm reiterate that after the initial guarding position, that player may look, move lateral or backward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yes, we have a question. Leona, Kite, go ahead. It's, it's not a question, more like a, if you want to say a come to Jesus moment. Um, I think Amen. those videos <laughs> helped. <Amen. laughs> it, 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 helped it, it has helped me to, to really internalize some of the plays that I've seen over the years wow. and some of the calls that were made or not made. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just, it's, it's not really a question, but it's just one of those moments that is like, oh, okay. So that's how I share that. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Mr. Sterling. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. And um, again, just want to uh, commend, commend uh, actually uh, Sir Wilmore and uh, Brown for excellent presentation. But um, I think uh, the videos, again, um, like Ms. Uh, Leona just shared just now, uh, is an eye opener. And um, for me, I guess it's always a culture of uh, judging the defense. But um, I think, especially, I think it was the first, the first play um, where I think it was uh, the United States uh, player red and, and, and white uh, and a female. Uh, if you did not look closely, the contact was actually initiated by the offensive player going to the basket. And if I was in that position, before this training, I would have, I would have definitely uh, made the call against the red player. And so, you know, I, I just want to say thanks for this training because, again, you know, it only helps us to improve our craft and to get better at what we're doing. So, um, thanks, and just keep keep doing what you guys are doing, man. The learning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right before we get to you, Miguel, I'll just say uh, one thing in response to Kay Sterling. Yes, yeah, so that's why these IOTs are very important. I have this saying that I always tell referees when, when I'm doing Sir, some sort of... Can I, can I weigh in before you go there? Yes, go ahead. Can you give the acronym for IOT, please? Uh, IOT is, stands for Individual Officiating Techniques. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying um, one thing we, we um, I always tell referees, when you call a foul, in particular a defensive foul, most fouls are defensive fouls, what you are telling everyone in the gym, what you're telling me as an instructor or anyone as an instructor, you're saying the defensive player did something wrong. That's what a foul is. You're saying in trying to play defense, they did something wrong. And so I always ask young referees, you call a block, okay, 
you're telling me the defensive player did something wrong. Can you tell me now what did they do wrong? And if you can't tell me what the defensive player did wrong, then chances are they were in their legal guarding position. You can't just call a foul because there was some contact and you feel like a foul should be called. You know, the, the, the foul says, were, were they moving towards the player? Were they outside of their cylinder? Did they not establish the initial legal guarding position? When we're talking about block charge plays, you need to be able to say as a referee, one of those things to explain why it was a block, not just there was contact. And if you can't identify the defensive player as having not done one of those things, then you probably shouldn't blow your whistle. Or the foul is on the offense. That's the other option. Okay, Miguel, um, you've been waiting. You can go ahead. Yes, good evening, everyone. Miguel Peter from the Cayman Islands. Um, just a question on the video earlier where um, the offensive player is shooting and extends the leg. When, 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 a, when a referee makes a right call, yes. after the shot has been taken and the player extends his leg and the contact is made, does the basket count and then you give the offensive foul or the basket does not count? So... so I will answer your question as simply and as quickly as I can. So if that, so you're, we're assuming the offensive player is, in, is illegal in this situation. If the illegal action occurred, meaning the, the contact with the extended leg occurred prior to the ball being released on the shot, then the shot will not count. If, however, the, the offensive player has already released the ball for a shot, and you call a foul on that player for tripping the defensive player or something of that sort, then the basket will count. And without going into too much of the details, because that's not um, really the context of this thing, I will just say the only thing that we have to be mindful of is um, if you talk about status of the ball and team control, once the ball has been released for a shot, it also would not be considered a quote unquote offensive foul or in the FIBA uses the term team control foul because team control would have ended the minute the ball was released. So um, if you have more questions about that though, Miguel, you can definitely put them in the chat and I'll try to yeah. answer you um, on those issues because that can be a very complex situation. Yeah, we have, we have a presentation that will deal with that later on. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Ken Moore. Or is that one name? Ken Moore. Ken Moore Phillips from Barbados. Okay. okay. Uh, this was not in the videos, but I'm just querying. That is where the offensive player gets the ball in the post and the defender has a legal guarding position and he like actually like bounces back and powers into him to get his shot. Does that or is that constitute a charge? We'll cover that tomorrow. Okay, thanks very much. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So yeah, that we, we will get into the, that those specific scenarios tomorrow. So we got to make sure that you come back um, to catch that. Um, Mr. Brown, unless you have something to say, I'm just trying to read the chat. There's some people putting no, things. You go right ahead. Um, we got to go right ahead. We still have nine, nine minutes. Okay. So. Oh, so uh, um, I I'm, hope I don't get your name too wrong. Ashia. Um, uh, um, says, so since it's been proving, proven that recognizing the fouls are a, a bit, I guess she means to say are a bit tough for a ref, can you tell me how exactly you can improve your judgment during a game? Um, Ashia, uh, I don't know how long you've been refereeing, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, if, but I will say the, the easiest um, uh, um, the, well, the, not easiest, maybe easiest in the right word. The best place to start is ref in these situations in particular, referee the defense. As I said earlier, when you blow your whistle, you are saying in a block charge situation, and, and most times it's going to be a block, right? Most fouls are defensive fouls. So when you blow your whistle and you call a foul, you're saying the defensive player did something wrong. So if you are refereeing the defense and you are watching, when did he or she establish the initial legal guarding position? 
after they established the initial legal guiding position, did he move laterally or backwards or did he move towards the player? When contact occurred, was it in the torso or was it on the knee or was it on the shoulder? And when you, when you analyze the defense, you will make 99% of these decisions much easier because you'll be able to say, he, the defensive player was moving laterally, contact was on the torso, so it has to be a charge. The whole thing is don't get caught up in the offensive play and all of the other thing. Focus on what the defense is doing. If the defense, if you cannot say what the defense has done incorrectly, then chances are it's an offensive foul. That's the uh, best just, way. Just, just to chime in also, um, we must consider, consider the mechanics um, two person or three person mechanic and one of a couple of things that we covered this evening um, 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 in analyzing the phases of a play in order to make the call you must have proper distance and you be stationary when you make the call that's one keeping an open angle at least 45 degrees all right and remain stationary when you're making the call and then it says, referee the defense. How can you referee the defense between two players? You must look between the spaces between the two players and then concentrate your effort on refereeing the defense. The next thing is then you look for that illegal action, particularly from the defense. This is called the active mindset. That is what you're looking for, that contact. And then have um, um, key players and others in your field of vision. These are just some basic principles and, and analyzing when to make that call. But um, the individual or, um, officiating technique will speak to a lot of that when you go and you do the mechanics, the tree poison, refereeing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, Michael, so your question is, what if you are somehow not facing the ball and the ball handler runs into you? That's Michael's question. So I'm assuming, you are probably playing defense on a, a on someone else for and whatever reason your back is turned to the ball handler and the ball handler runs into you. Well, Michael, if you go back to the last slide, well, not that you have this slide, but there are three basic things we want to look at. Did the defensive player establish an initial legal guarding position? After they established that initial legal guiding position, did they move laterally or backward? And was the contact on the torso? In your scenario, the player never faced the ball handler, which means they have not met the first criteria to be legal. They have not established an initial legal guarding position. Now, if you if we're going into something um, um, much different where the ball handler, in, if you're going to say he intentionally runs into the back, almost like, you know, pushes over the defensive player or something like that, who is not, you know, that that's a, a gray area. But generally speaking, if you're not facing the, the, the offensive player, then you, you can't be in a legal guarding position. And so a nine times out of 10, with the exception of some gray areas, that's going to be a, a blocking foul on the defensive player in that scenario. Um, let's see if we have some more questions. Ryan has a very good question. When making a block charge call, how much contact do you allow? <laughs> that is a very complex question. Um, simple question, but Indeed. not the easiest to answer. I will answer it like this you have to analyze what impact did the illegal contact have on the plane and there's all kind of you know acronyms that i can give you you know we've been taught the rsbq there's been which stands for rhythm speed balance quickness if the contact impedes any one of those four things if it's a um, um a, if a legal contact from the defense um impedes the offensive players Just rhythm speed, balance, or quickness, then you need to call it. That was one principle. There's the principle of advantage, disadvantage. If that contact puts the other player at a disadvantage or gives the um, a committing player an advantage, then you need to call it. But the, the thing is, no one play is the same, right? There are some contacts that in one scenario might not affect the play at all. And that same contact in a different play situation 
could have all the more effect. Um, I will say this. For instance, if you are committing a blocking foul on an airborne player, when a player is in the air, for example, and I'm not going into the details, but the slightest little contact can put an airborne player at a disadvantage because they don't have control of their body. So a little bump on someone mid-air can throw them off, can put them at a bad angle, can force them off the court. And so you can, I, in, in, in that scenario, it is plausible that you can have what we would call a ticky-tack you know, block foul, because in that scenario, it affects the play. That same level of contact on a ball handler might not be worthy of calling a defensive foul. So you really have to see the whole play and analyze what was the impact and effect of that contact. Did it give someone an advantage? Did it put someone at a disadvantage? If it's not doing any of those things, then I would suggest you probably don't call that foul. Okay. Um, we have one question here, uh, Mr. Brown. This is the last one. Um, I don't know how to pronounce this name. Um, Z, I'll just call it Z. Z asks, uh, the female player basketball game video time. Okay, so he's going from the video. Uh, Mr. Brown, if you want to take a look at five minutes and 40 seconds on the video, it says you can see that the defender steps on the feet of the offensive player, that means she was out of her legal guarding position, but still it was called charging. Can you explain? I, um, I did not go through that, that particular video, um, Christian. Okay, so- I have a screen on, sorry. Z, let me just, um, I'll take a quick look here. Okay. So um, I see what you're talking about. Um, so Z, here's the thing. You, we're able to see that number one due to the, uh, how, how should I say, due to the instant replay and slowing down the video. We have this saying in, in, in refereeing, uh, call the obvious. Um, in that moment, no one would be aware that there was some, and we would call that negligible contact um, by stepping onto the foot. Imagine. Yes, there was some stepping on the foot there, but imagine you decide not to call the obvious play, which is the elbow in the chest of the defensive player, but you decide to call the, you know, player who happens to put their big toe on the shoe of the defensive player or vice versa. That, that in, in the grand scheme of things, um, you, you don't want to make those type of, of calls. Um, you want to call the obvious, the obvious play there that everyone saw, that everyone is going to accept, that, that had the most impact on the play was the elbow into the chest of the defensive player. I don't know if we have any more questions. There's no more in the chat, and we're just, we're one minute over time. Does anyone have any last minute question they would like to ask before we? Or comment. Or comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you gentlemen did a very good job, an excellent job, I must say. You did an excellent job tonight. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. All right, Mr. Brown, I don't think we have any more questions. I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, and uh, okay. everyone is quiet, so I think we're done for the night. Okay, um, um, thank you very much for chiming in um, all the way to the end. I think um, we covered any number of points. You say, what is the legal guarding position? The guidelines for calling the block or the charge. Situation when blocking the charge generally occurs. The emotional response, contact general principle, the cylindrical principle, the principle of verticality. What is a legal guarding position? Guarding a player who controls the ball and judging the block or charge situation involving a player with or without the ball. And of course, you had some videos. We end with some videos. So we cover a whole lot of items today. We're going to conclude tomorrow um, with post play and screens and some other items. Um, that no charge semi, no semi circle. Yeah. That's no, an important no chart. one. Yep. So we're going to conclude with that tomorrow. And we're going to have a little bit more videos um, than normal to get everybody involved. So just, remind, just a reminder. If you are on this program, 
you are considered to be a notional referee. So everything that you see, you got to make a judgment. Whether you give the answer or not, you made a judgment. You say, I, hey, I think it's a charge. I think it's a block. So you are a notional referee. So thank you so kindly um, for chiming in. And um, I turn it over to um, uh, Mr. Patrick Haynes. Uh, Freddie and uh, Christian, um, I think you guys did a fantastic job um, this evening. Um, again, um, to all of our participants, uh, thank you. Um, we look forward to seeing you back here again tomorrow night. I know it's, uh, it's the weekend, but we do appreciate you uh, spending an hour and a half of your day with us uh, to help improve our sport from an officiating um, perspective. Again, thank you and good night. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Good night. Thank you. Peace out. Peace out. Peace out. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Patrick. Patrick. Good night. Yeah, do some shit, mate. I think Patrick left already. Okay, he left the chat. Mr. Okay. Brown. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, do you have my number? Yes, I do. Uh, could you give me a call on WhatsApp, please? Yes, please. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Ready? Yes, sir. Check, okay. yes, appreciate it, Press. How's it going? Good job, then. It's going. It's we just complete complete that exercise. No, I, I, I listen to it. Excellent. Oh, okay. You're coming in a little broken. Go ahead, you, were, you, were little, you, were, you were a little broken up. We didn't quite hear what you were saying there. Oh, I was saying good job, Christian. Good oh, job, okay, okay thank you. Excellent discussion and um, good execution tonight. So, what's on? What's on tomorrow, Fred? Um, we continue with the same um items: the block charge in the post, in the screen, and then dealing with it from the um semicircle, the no charge semicircle. And then we have a lot more videos, and we're gonna try post the videos this time so everybody could see it, yeah. including myself. So that's but what we're looking for. Also, though, because um, so you have some challenge tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, good job. Thanks for chiming in. Yeah, man. Take care. Appreciate it. All right. I'm 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 ending the meeting now, everyone. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern time.